So when, when we talk about democracy, uh, first of all, I would like to stress out uh, it's a topic and a concept that comes from many years ago. And I think Professor Robinson will also talk more about the philosophical aspects, but it embraces uh, different features. And as you can see, I, I took this from a uh, think tank in Stockholm called IDEA, it's the Institute of Democracy. So when we talk about democracy, we're looking at what kind of rights uh, people uh, have to, uh, what's the access for justice, what's the rule of law, what about civil liberties, uh, it comprehends social rights, but it also has this component of the government. Uh, how do we implement elections in countries if we are even the age uh, to emerge a vote? Uh, how inclusive is that participation in elections? It, are they free political parties or not? How the government is elected or not? And also, uh, and particularly nowadays, we, we have seen that uh, more and more people are participating in democracy. Here in this component, in the orange part, we have civil society, but I would say that you can see uh, more inclusive processes where it is not only civil society, now private sector, academy, all people are taking a role within democracy. Um, and how direct or not it is, also the different levels of democracy, if it's national, if it's local, how is the administration when we would talk about democracy, if there is corruption or not. This goes also, it's entailed to the, to the SDG 16. Uh, if, we, if we remember about the SDG 16, the SDG 16 in the 23 agenda talks about strong institutions, reliable institutions that are accountable, that, uh, that we can trust them. And finally, how are their powers divided, right? So all these ideas comprehend uh, democracy. And if, if we talk about democracy, we, we can think as an idealistic concept when we talk about participatory decision-making, rights, freedoms, votes. Uh, and just to have an overview, uh, there are two indexes where I would like to talk about. Uh, this one is from The Economist. So as we can see, the, this index is from 2020. And well, according to The Economist, we see that there's only 8% of the whole countries in the world that are uh, labeled as full democracies. Uh, and well, that even now with the pandemic, uh, this index has uh, stressed that the democracy index went down this year. Um, and we have another index as well, but well, this, uh, the democracy index, for example, it measures if the systems are competitive or not, the age where people, when people can vote, uh, how elections are performed, if there are liberties when people are voting, uh, even how it's security measures when we talk about the elections and how is the access to, to this political decision-making. So that, that's one index. And the other one that could also stress a bit of how we can see democracy is this one called the Global Freedom Index from the Freedom House. And this one talks more about civil liberties and it is course countries, uh, how pluralist is the participation, how individuals' rights are performed or not, how is the rule of law. And one thing that I would like to mention uh, in this first panel is, as we can see in ethics and democracy, there are so many horizons when we talk, it's not only black or white when we talk about democracy. Uh, there are different scopes and, and from that sense, uh, one of my first questions, and also for, for you as, uh, as our participants, is in these two indexes, who is measuring democracy? Uh, who, who are the ones measuring democracy? And what are the implications of those measures? Because I can tell you from a development and peace as, as consultant, when we apply to grants or projects, if countries are not democratic, this also hinders the possibilities to, to gain support. Uh, at the same time, how do we foment democracy 
coming from like because I would say this is more Western oriented. These measurements are from a Western perspective, which is good. Um, but that also sets the standards that are sometimes not locally owned or culturally owned. So yeah, I would like to to hear and see your comments about that as well. Um, what has happened with the pandemic with both indexes and they both mention is that well, on one side, uh, the pandemic has shown that the live that lockdowns and liberties has provoked the rollback of individual freedoms on one side. And it's interesting because it's not necessarily means that we are in war times or conflicts, even in a peaceful time, and uh, this index has slowed down. And especially with the global freedom, uh, it says that even social distancing has been implemented by countries to try to contain and uh, contain the spread of the virus. At the same time, the alternatives to promote the freedoms we are talking about have been not very convincing. Uh, and well, that also hinders freedom of expression or freedom of voice. Uh, and and even though like even we have seen these trends coming one thing that i would be interesting to discuss as well is uh, if we talk about the, this year and last year even with the pandemic we have seen many social movements uh, around the world coming if we think this from an individual perspective uh, I think it's really interesting to, to try to reflect on we have the pandemic and there is a risk for people and that's why we have these lockdowns. But at the same time, when people have to choose between staying home or going out to uh, denounce and try to denounce uh, these authoritarian regimes or the lack of freedoms, many people have decided to go out. Uh, in the midst uh, of this pandemic and these social lockdowns. Uh, in, for example, in Colombia, we, we have a network that it's a Latin American network of young peace builders. So in the recent months, we have heard a lot about friends who have gone out to the streets. And, and one of the things about the democracy and we were talking about the governance is, well, the lack of uh, freedom of expression and, and how uh, saying something about the government can be also a threat to a lot to their lives, and that has not only happened in Colombia. We remember also uh, the uh, the movements in the U.S. with Black Black Lives Matter or Myanmar. So this has happened even with the pandemics. Uh, just I want to wrap up so so Professor Robinson can participate. Um, in Mexico, this is more from uh, from my experience the last year, uh, being a, an activist uh, and uh, an upper, well, spending my time, uh, most of my time during the pandemic. There were different things about freedom and democracy that are uh, happening right now. Um, we have a, a coming election in July and political parties are also uh, being, um, uh, they have the lack of expression in some ways, and a lot of candidates uh, have been killed in the last weeks. Uh, from from not only from cartels, like it can be uh, different. It's multifactorial, but the, this participation it can be very dangerous. Um, also, feminist movements, uh, even with the pandemic, there have there has been a strong participation of women in social movements. Uh, also, last week happened that the president uh, labeled some professors, some academics who are critical about the government and, and in the way they were banned. And as I was saying before, the militarization and the participation of police, this is not only a, a, a thing that happens in Mexico, but also in many countries in Latin America. Uh, I know in many countries also, for example, in Nigeria with SARS, how the militaries uh, are participating right now with the with the lockdowns. So uh, this is an overview of what, what I think it's, we could uh, reflect 
about democracy, how democracy is implemented. And finally, uh, before I, uh, I finish my participation, all these social movements and all what we have been talking to about democracy has to be also discussed in the digital world, because now digital world is taking uh, a place in democracy. And we have to see to what extent is good. Uh, it should be the expression of freedom. Who controls this expression of freedom? Uh, is it the, the private companies that are owning the social media? Is it the governments? And what happens with the ethos, the pathos and the logos? What we express in, in the social network tends to, uh, to drive emotions and also actions for the population. And I, I think uh, the US example with Trump and and, the, uh, and this transition to Biden was a, uh, an example of this. <laughs>